Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking, as today I'm out at the Birdall Sawmill to talk about one thing, slabs. And most importantly, how to pick and choose slabs, because that seems to be a knowledge base that a lot of people don't have. Now, Brandon Birdall, he's been on the channel before. I really like coming out here. I, my opinion, he's had this place for about 14 years now, and he really is one of those woodworkers running a business and doing it all right a perfect balance between family, business, and community. And he spends a lot of time building up the knowledge base for local schools, universities, that kind of stuff, and sharing information unbelievably generously. And hopefully we can tap into a lot of his knowledge base today because there's a lot of stuff about slabs that I just don't understand because they're a lot different than boards. Now, normally when I'm building furniture, not my wood turning stuff. This is the kind of stuff I buy. I've been trained. You go to the lumber, uh, the lumber yard, the hardwood dealer, stuff like that. You go to the rough stacks, or sometimes you can go buy the pre-milled ones that are already surfaced and stuff like that. I like the rough stacks because a lot of times I'm dividing these in half to get my parts or that kind of stuff. The problem is that when you start looking for the ultimate quality and stuff like that, a lot of times in these stacks, they come from a lot of different trees. Because you have to understand, the, the lumber mills that are making this kind of stuff, they're making it for the board foot. That's where they're getting their money. They're maximizing the yield. Whereas if you're buying slabs, a lot of times it's for the aesthetics. It's for the quality of that one board that you're going to use throughout the piece. That's why we're here at Birdall's, so that he has probably the biggest selection of slabs I've seen in Texas. He could show us what, what's what. And now that was the stuff I normally buy. But we're here to talk to Brand, Brandon Birdall mm -hmm. about slabs. And this is a slab. Now this one particular one, you told me somebody was just looking at to buy. Yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. <laughs> okay. He wasn't just going to put this in the back of an eight-foot pickup, was he? Not quite. So there's things that, uh, that customers are typically looking for when they look at slabs. You know, there's a lot of different things you get with slabs that you don't get with lumber. So, like, you know, there's these spalting lines that come from the fungal spores that are breaking down the wood. And there's these little ambrosia beetle holes where bugs have gotten into it because this is a reclaimed slab. And then you obviously have some cracks here that would typically be omitted from lumber, you know, like yeah. the lumber that we looked at earlier. All that stuff over there, all this would be a defect. This wouldn't even make it to the stacks, right? For sure, all this stuff. This might, but uh, the cracks wouldn't. It'd be omitted from that, from the lumber. Okay, now, me personally, when I'm looking for a slab, I'm actually looking to avoid this kind of stuff simply because this is more labor for me to fill. Correct. But it's an aesthetic a lot of people are looking for, right? Some people really love it. Uh, they really just like the features and uh, you can fill this with clear or black epoxy and you get these cool little the patterns or you know you can make river tables out of it so sure it does increase uh, the labor cost but that's some things that um, some people are looking for okay so some of the really cool things about this slab is like these little dormant buds are kind of like you can see in there where there's a little blemish right there when you spray with mineral spirits you put a finish on it it will just kind of pop and then there's like change in color so that's you know here's the heartwood and it's a certain brown here and then it's a little lighter there uh, it's obviously very dark right there so there's this little blemish or this little knot right here you can see the grain kind of changes and i can spray it with mineral spirits and you can see right there you get this dark color there and light and light right there so if you were building a piece of furniture you might be able to put a knob or something there and it would kind of project out or if you're sitting at the table looking at it, it's kind of a cool feature to to look at so that's just a big difference between defects and in, in features in lumber a lot of this stuff would be tr you would try to remove it but in a slab you just use it as a feature so these cracks the knot there the spalting uh, the little ambrosia beetle holes and stuff are just all features where it would normally be taken out if you're sawing lumber out of the same log. And that's why the high-end furniture makers a lot of times, or sometimes, they start with slabs even though they're only making a panel or a case because this entire board could all of a sudden become a bunch of door, drawer fronts and it's all matched up. You right. couldn't do that when, with an individual six-inch board. You'd need this much. Yeah, typ typically the boards are narrow and you don't get enough boards from the same log to do what you're wanting to do. So you could take a big slab and you could cut 
panels out of certain sections. You could cut rails and styles and uh, drawer fronts and all these different things from one slab and you're, you're kind of picking and choosing what things, what features you want in certain areas. And you could even take a slab like this and resaw it and make lots and lots of veneers so the whole piece would match out of this one slab. Uh, and that's typically something that you cannot get if you're buying commercial lumber. So slabs give you options? There are lots of options, yeah. Okay. The problem is I'm an idiot. How do I know I'm not gonna waste money on a certain slab? How do I pick out a good slab? Well, typically, if you know what your final product's gonna be, is it gonna be a bar top? Is it gonna be a table top? Is it gonna be you know, a conference table, dining table? You kind of start with what is the end product gonna be? And then you, you start from there sense. and you work backwards and you ask yourself like, is it, is it wide enough? You know, if you need a dining table, if it's only a 28 inch wide slab, probably not gonna make a dining table. Um, okay, well, question. I'm looking at slabs. I want them wide. I can't, there isn't that big an option. We're going to be slip, slipping it or mm -hmm. book matching book it. Matching it. Yep. In slabs, are there different things I wanna look for if that's the goal? If I know that I'm going to wanna glue up two pieces to get a mm -hmm. lot wider piece? Sure, so I would look at each individual slab and like put a piece of blue tape or put a straight line on it, like a, a fake straight line. Show me. So here's an example. These are two book or a book match set that a customer came in the other day, and okay. we're going book match. Yes. You had a thick log. How, how did we get here? So the book match is two consecutive cut boards out of the same log that you basically saw through and you fold them out, and so it looks like a book. And so these this board would just fold over. Um, okay, so it's not like me. I didn't. You did. This is from the this is book match from the tree, from the log, not just tree. a split board. So that's Correct. how you're getting a thickness, and still be dry, right? Correct. Okay, yeah, that's some slabs. <laughs> cool. So we're gonna. I'm you know, giddy this, people. I like this stuff. Okay. <laughs> this is a book match set, and the customer wanted a desk, but okay. we didn't have a slab that was that wide that was this short. So we selected two slabs, and we're gonna cut a straight edge here cut a straight edge here and a straight edge here, and we're gonna bring them together. And so you'll have the mirror image in the middle, and then this is gonna be the outside part of the desk where they sit. And so we were able to yield, I think a 36 inch wide desktop from these two slabs by straight lining them and book matching them together. So that's how you can get uh, a piece that's wide, um, your desired width out of two pieces if the one is not available. And I'm noticing that these are not completely, par you didn't just line these up vertically. You're, it looks like you kind of angled them so that the grain would match top yes. to bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the flexibility. Now I'm looking at this one. We still have some of these cracks right where maybe it was a branch or something coming off here. Yep, that's a little fern, fern crotch there. Okay. And as a woodworker, because this is coming straight from the tree, could these parts probably be used in the same desk as at reinforcements or something like that too. Sure. I mean, they could use, they use as, as book stops, you know, up above or uh, a corbel for underneath to support the desk or anything. And so if there are off fall or drop offs, even this like, little slender piece over here, that could be used for the backsplash uh, to cover up, you know, where the reason why I brought that up is because a lot of times when I, when I first look at something like that, I'm always thinking that this is just wasted for me, but I see these people at the furniture shows, they're using this kind of stuff as elements within the same piece, and that's what makes it pop, and that's the kind of stuff that I don't think about. I'm just looking at it myself, but I see examples of what the real guys are doing, and that's what, that's what looks cool. Yeah. yeah, people try to utilize all of the material that you can, so it could be even, you know, little, you know, sculptures or bowls, you could turn that into a shallow platter or anything. So, okay, this is obviously a book match set, um, but in a minute we'll go look at top that didn't even need to be book matched to get the full width. Okay, now, now book matching, one thing I do want to point out though, is when I build these kind of tabletops, because I've always gone to the racks to pull out, pull out shelves, you know, you glue up those six inch, eight inch boards to make a wide tabletop. Well, if you don't get the grain perfectly aligned, Maybe a tree grew this way, a tree grew this way, and then the other one grew that way. Light's going to reflect differently, even if the board came from the same tree. So those glue line joints really show up. I mean, it looks something like a Tim Burton striped tabletop, even though it's the same walnut top. 
book matching, you don't have any problem like that one because if it's book matched, that's the way it grew in the tree. No light problems at all. So this is an example of a slab that has a lot of features in it. There's bark inclusions, there's burl, there's figure. Um, uh, there was a big crack here, and if this log would have been sawn into lumber, all of this would have been defect. This out. wouldn't have been sawn into lumber. Shouldn't have been. <laughs> this would yeah. never have made it through the mill. They would not be making Yeah. So, but it, you can just see all of the features that are in this, um, and it doesn't need a book match. This is a, a tabletop, and it's wide enough that two pieces don't need to be put together, that it's, it's in the 40 inches wide, so. Okay. Now, I am noticing that this one, the cathedral, is going all one direction to keep a flow going. So that's the kind of stuff that I would be looking for whenever I did it, because personally, I don't like the cathedrals. I think it's direct changing, but that's an opinion piece, and that's what you can get when you're looking at slabs. Mm -hmm. Man, this is cool. And this is the spalting that I think is so cool that you can get in slags, but this right here, I'm never going to find a bore like this at a hardwood dealer because this is all defects to them. But to me, I've got, even if I couldn't get a long slab like this, I'm sitting here thinking this right here and its sister on the other side would make great panels in a door, and this right here would make my styles and stuff like that. So an offcut, even like that's perfect for me because I can't fit this table in my kitchen. But branding, from, coming from the wood terminal, I understand features and defects and stuff like that, and that's why I like this kind of stuff, but I still don't know how to, what am I looking for when I buy this stuff? This, is, this can get pricey when you're going sure. that way. Yeah, the biggest thing you need to look for are slabs that are truly dry. Truly dry. Truly how, dry. how am I gonna know that walking in? The, use a moisture meter. That's the absolute best way is to use a moisture meter okay. to determine that. Show us. All right. Okay, Sean, here's the top that's been glued up just using lumber. Can you see the differences in the color? Oh, this is an ex excellent example, except he did it right. He aligned the grain so that the light reflects differently. But can you see right here, that transition right there? If you didn't have the pores going in the same direction as it did it, light would reflect differently coming this direction and this direction. So even though it's a matte finish on that, it would look totally different and it really pops out if you don't get these two aligned perfectly. They did it right here, but yeah, it's a good example. So this is a moisture meter and these things can save you lots of time and lots of money. There's different uh, types and things like that, but they all kind of work on the bank basic concept. They shoot electric wave into the board okay. and then it reflects back. So we can put this on the slab. So you can see that that's reading 5.8% and, and it varies a little bit on the density. So there's heartwood there. If we move over, still 5.9, 5968, so it's not really 4.8, it's a little higher than that, but this wood is not quite as dense right there. It's spalted, so it's spalted. It, it took away the density a little bit there, but that's what gives you the cool features. Yeah, Being, having a slab that's between six and eight percent moisture content, if you start with that, that'll save you a lot of headaches down the road. Okay, now, I'm sorry, I don't have one of those, and I kind of doubt most interior designers are coming in to pick out slabs off of Facebook Marketplace or something like that to do it. Is that kind of a litmus test if they have one of those available for you to use for at a sawmill? A sawmill or a lumber distributor should definitely have a moisture meter on hand. And, if, and a lot of times if you ask them to use it, they'll let you use it. So uh, it's definitely something that people that are producing high quality slabs and lumber are they're checking with, with a moisture meter. Okay, this is cool. This is the kind of stuff I like because, as I said earlier, I don't care for the cracks, but the coloration, that is, that's a tabletop for me. That's gorgeous. Yes. I like that. Once you've identified a, that the slab is truly dry, you want to ask yourself how flat is it? And they can either be surfaced or rough sawn, and so that can add a lot of work if it's rough, just like this piece over here. Now this is something I can explain because this is how I buy wood lumber rough. What that means is it's straight off the bandsaw. And can you see as you're looking down in it, it's not flat. I run my hands over it. It's coming up over here. It's got a high spot right there. And this is wide enough that I don't have any machine that can flatten it. So the only way I'm gonna get this thing flat is a lot of sweat equity. This is what he's talking about by rough surfacing. 
So this is an example of a slab that has been truly flattened on one face first and then flipped over and planed to a consistent thickness. So there's a lot of work that's been done to this slab versus when it was rough sawn. Okay, when you say flat, you mean cosmetically flat, right? Because I can get it cosmetically flat, flat with, a, with a floor sander on the ground, but is it going, it's, the light's still going to reflect in, at curves. This, mm -hmm. what, when you're coming to places like you and others around the country, you're actually paying for flat, flat, not cosmetic flat. Sure, so this machine, this slab was put on a machine that flattens the face to within 30 thousandths of an inch. So however flat okay. you wanna Better me. call that. One thing that we're constantly talking to customers about is the application for the certain slab. So there are individual slabs that would make a great wall hanging or a piece of art, uh, but wouldn't make a great table. And so those things have to do with like how hard and how stiff the wood is. Like this piece right here, you know, uh, this would be great to go on the wall because there's some little soft spots and there's some voids in it where it might not make the best side table. Another thing you wanna take into consideration when purchasing slabs is the actual species and the characteristics of that species, where there are some woods like cottonwood or maybe sycamore that are soft, that don't have good application for flooring or other things, where pecan or mesquite, if that's something that's really hard, uh, there are better applications for that. Also is stability, so if you have something that's gonna be outdoors or in a, in a tough environment like an exterior door, a species like mesquite would be really, really great because it's so stable, or there'd be other species that wouldn't uh, work for that application because there's too much movement there. So that's another thing to ask is uh, what species do you have and how do those species best apply to my application? Okay, you're talking about species and what I like about species, different colors. Right, there are some <laughs> species like mesquite that it's pretty much the same color and other ones like pecan, you get these huge variations of sap wood and heart wood and all that. And one thing that you have to look for is what is it gonna look like once you finish it? And so if uh, they'll allow you, if you just take a little bit of mineral spirits or denatured alcohol and just do a little spray on it, that will tell you the exact color that you're gonna get when you put a finish on it. Um, typically you don't wanna put water on it because you don't wanna introduce moisture, but denatured alcohol or mineral spirits doesn't hurt it at all. And you can see the grain and you can see the true color real well. Okay, I do know over time that color is going to change a little bit Correct. Is there a general rule, walnut lightens, will mesquite darken? Or? Yes, so it depends on where it's at. So if you get indirect sunlight, the mesquite and cherry and things like that, they will darken. Walnut typically gets lighter over time or even kind of more orangey. Uh, but if it, this material or any really any material is in direct sunlight, it will always want to go back to gray. So it will, it will lighten. And so I have seen mesquite exterior doors where on the inside of the door, it's really, really dark four or five years later, and on the outside of the door, it's really, really light. So it depends on what type of light is hitting the wood. Okay, so generally if you're out here selecting, the experts should be able to tell you which direction they're gonna go, whether light or dark? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, Brandon. Now we've been talking about what other people are looking for. I know you have a secret stash somewhere. Can we take a look at that? We can, let's go. Okay. So this is a slab that came out of my personal collection and I selected it because of the <gasps> absolute intense figure on it. <laughs> yeah, that is cur pecan curly, yep. cool. And this is an up close shot of curly. So I spray the mineral spirits on it and you can see the tiger stripes and the intense curl show up in that. That's only in gonna intensify when you sand and plane it, right? Correct, yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay, thanks, Brandon, for letting sure. me waste half your afternoon. It's this kind of stuff that I do appreciate from Brandon because he does these kind of educational for the community all the time, even for schools that aren't customers. And what's that? All all, the, all rising tides raise all ships. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for visiting. Now, I wanted to show this kind of video to you all because... All the time I'm telling y'all, it's always about the grain in woodworking. The joinery, the tools you use, the edges you use, how you use the tools, it all comes to the grain. But I'm still at that amateur level, and y'all have seen when I go out to those shows like Kerrville and stuff like that, what blows my mind away is the people that are making the furniture at the upper echelon, the stuff that's getting 10, 20, $30,000 for a cabinet or table, 
they take grain understanding to the nth level. I mean, as I said earlier, Nakashima, he's kind of known that he started from the tree. He would go out and buy logs and then tell the Sawyer how to saw them for what he wanted to get out of it. And he had a huge collection of not only logs, but rough sawn lumber at his disposal to go pick and choose from. Even the guys that are just making a small side table, when they're at that nth level, they're taking the tabletops to the nth degree. A lot of times they're using sections of a slab so that these defects that we've been talking about that are actually features in slabs, well, they're positioning it so that it's balanced, so it looks perfect. I remember one, one uh, uh, table, I was looking at the stretchers, and the guy had picked the perfect board out of some kind of wood so that the curvature was balanced. It wasn't steam vent. It wasn't that kind of stuff. He picked that board, and the only way he could have done it is to start with something like this, come over, see the sap wood, notice, hey, this right here is that curve I want, so here is my board for that portion of the table. They thought about it from the tree of what they wanted that's going to be sitting at the platform at the show. And that's the kind of stuff that boggles my mind. And when you're buying slabs, you have that kind of option. So I kind of, buying slabs are, is even intimidating for me. So when you go into these places, pick a reputable place and trust them. Ask them questions. They'll be able to give you answers to it. And you'll have selections that you can pick and choose from to get one entire piece out of one slab if you've carefully selected it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Again, I thank Brandon for letting us come plagiarize all the stuff he has around here. And remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.